I want to treat the Baltimore Park experience that the Olmstead Group uh, basically worked on for 40 years almost. Uh, I'm going to tie it to the emerging profession of city planning, which is people have pointed out before that Frederick Olmstead was a very important figure. And it's often easy to think of a parks plan as just dealing with the parks. But as we'll see from the get-go, the Baltimore Parks Plan was designed to, to promote certain city planning goals as they existed at the time. The Parks Plan was always tied to street extension, street development. Uh, these are early efforts at what we today would call growth management or smart growth or whatever the brand name is for the current five years, but it's always about getting some rationality, some sense of purpose, and some control over what otherwise are completely uninhibited, aimless, just growth, growth, growth. Baltimore is one of the most important cities in America that is also one of the most understudied. And because of that, even though the Baltimore work of the Olmstead firm is very important, was very sustained, and very much covers the whole spectrum of what the firm did, it too has kind of suffered from a, a general neglect outside the Baltimore area. Uh, this should be corrected because there's a lot of valuable lessons. Olmstead himself, in the late 30s, writing to someone, basically pointed out that he felt the 1904 plan was one of the finest of its kind he ever did. He also pointed out in a letter to one of his patrons in Baltimore that he seldom had a relationship with a city that had lasted so long. This is in 1938, so this is getting close to four decades worth. Um, the Parks Plan and what came out of it was the framework for a lot of Olmstead work. Uh, you may be very familiar with some of the suburban development, Roland Park, Guilford, that kind of thing that's fairly generally known and fairly generally appreciated. There's a whole slew of other things that were done we can't touch on today. I mean, you could have a whole day seminar on this. So we're going to try to cover 40 years of this in 20 minutes. So I would ask you to buckle up, sign the waivers, and let's go. Baltimore, the work on the park system in Baltimore has many parallels with Washington, but I think it's important to realize there are some very crucial differences in the context. Washington was a national capital. Uh, there's great interest in making the national capital sort of the pride of the nation, you know, to show that America had arrived on the world scene. Um, so over time, especially after the Senate plan, there's a national constituency developed to promote improvements in Washington. Baltimore never has this. Basically, even today, the most national interest in Baltimore is which tunnel to use to get through it. Uh, what Baltimore did have, though, was a kind of locally based interest in civic improvement. From the mid-1890s on, basically, the people of influence in the city are just tired of how ugly and dysfunctional it is and decide to do something about it. But Baltimore was always crippled in this period we're going to talk about. It didn't have effective home rule powers, especially for planning, until the late 30s. Everything that authorized would you to do some action it had to be passed in the state legislature. It, shaky financing of improvements, uh, bond issues are voted down, there's no national treasury to tap into if and when policies are decided upon and, and, and are actually to be implemented. So they work in Baltimore has a lot more obstacles to getting through and it, frankly it's surprising how much they got done. Now Baltimore in 1900 was twice as big as Washington. There's about a half a million people. But as you say, half a million people are confined in a very small area. This is a very dense city, partly because people of all classes live in attached housing. So it's a very dense city. Now in 1888, the city expanded and took in a whole new annexation area. It's largely on the west side and the north side with some small areas on the east side. Much of the attention, unlike Washington, which had the monumental core, which attracted a lot of attention nationally and in the city. There's going to be very little work done in this dense core because it's very hard to do. It's so built up and dense. There's a few small parks. So much of it is concerned with the, what they call the annexation area. In Baltimore, maybe perhaps Theodore Marburg, who was a very influential man, one of the founders of the Municipal Arts Society, 
kind of plays the role of McMillan. He's fostering city planning. He's pushing it. He's recruiting people to do it. Glenn Brown from Washington came up early on, gave a big lecture. So the Municipal Art Society had a land use committee, and Marburg was ahead. In 1900, he convinces the group as a whole to fund a study of a park system and a street system different than the grid for the annexation area. So right away, parks and street system lines of communication are tied together. One of the first things they do is start looking for a committee of experts. And what happens is by 1902, the committee of experts is essentially Frederick Hall Olmsted and his firm. Baltimore Parks in 1900 existed, but there was no system. There, oh, excuse me. There were four major parks that the city had inherited, so to speak. Druid Hill Park was a city creation, purposely developed as a country park. Glifton Park, Patterson Park, and Carroll Park were actually gifts, so they came to the city in a kind of ad hoc way over time. There's almost no green space in the center except for a few squares. There were a few new parks in the South Baltimore area that were pretty much undeveloped because the park board didn't claimed it did not have the money. There are no connections, and so what's happening is they're being tasked, Baltimore is tasking the Olmsted firm to make this part of a more coherent system. Advantage the Olmsted firm had when it did its plan was there was a massive overhaul of the Parks Board. Uh, parks Board before this was rather lackadaisical. Uh, it was very tolerant of petty corruption. Uh, it wasted money. It, there was no centralized management. Each quadrant had its own superintendent. When they took over uh, under Mayor McLean, the board got cleaned up. Only one remember member remained, which was a former mayor. Uh, Richard Venable, who's probably the city's leading real estate lawyer, becomes Park Board's chair. He has toured the park system in the making with Olmsted and Marburg before he gets appointed, so he's very aware of the Olmsted development. When he steps in, immediately they do a whole series of reforms. He contends he does have the resources to make improvements. And most importantly, they adopt the Olmsted Park Plan as official park board policy. So this thing went in four years from a vague concept to official city policy. As a former private planning consultant, this makes me extremely jealous. 19-4 plan is an interesting document. Uh, much of it is a kind of advocacy piece. Uh, the first 40 pages essentially are Cliff's notes on Olmsted principles of the role of park in urban development and the role different parks play for different functions. Um, the park benefits for Baltimore are deduced, is the term they use, from the experience of other cities, especially Boston. The same thing as in Washington. Boston is a big, big primary example. There's examples from Paris, London, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in fact, the first 40 pages of a 120-page report, Baltimore is never mentioned specifically. And it, it's a very, it's a, almost a philosophical argument they're setting up to convince whoever needs to be convinced the value of parks in the growth of cities. Uh, what it did do when it finally got to Baltimore, there's a section on the ecology of the region. It goes from tidal to Piedmont hills and valleys. And what they're doing is pointing out that each of these regions has a specific characteristic that could be used for specific park purposes and different purposes uh, could be uh, drawn out of them with the proper thinking. It starts one of the three maps. There's a metropolitan scale. It kind of shows some of the influence of Charles Eliot, but the report basically says, this is, we have to do this sometime. It's a great idea, but let's not worry about it right now because <laughs> we have what he called unspeakably more pressing needs were to deal with the annexation area which was already beginning to be flooded with development as the city expanded. Um, key recommendations was, the highest one was to get small recreation areas near the existing population. This is tied to the, you know, the emergence of the playground movement, which many of you are probably familiar with. One of the advantages at the time was one of the mayors, after the plan was adopted, his mother was ahead of one of these playground advocacy groups, J. Barry Mahul, so he was going to promote playgrounds. Um, 
The bulk of the recommendations are for park and parkway acquisitions in the annexation area ahead of growth. Now, one of the things you see is these um, curvy lines. These were proposed parkways, and the parkways was a very specific concept. They, sh they should be very broad corridors. They sh they're to carry the park experience in some form between going between two parks or, or approaching a park. They're curved. Buildings should not front on them. It's supposed to be a highly kind of somewhat isolated experience in the city. It's actually a very Victorian idea because it is geared for horse and carriage and pedestrians, horseback riding. And we're now at the beginning of the auto age and we'll see how this gets, this gets modified. Um, it was intended to be a framework for growth. How does that happen? Well, the, first of all, the Olmsted firm being who they were, were very much tied to dealing with the topography of an area. I mean, one of the first things they always demanded in a project was a topo map. And if you can't provide it, we'll do it and we'll charge you. Um, parks and connections are seen as a framework for development from the get-go. Uh, one of the key assumptions in the plan, it assumes most landowners who will be subdividing property within this framework are going to respond to it accordingly. And in fact, Olmsted makes a comment in there that those people not doing subdivisions in a proper or appropriate way, as long as the framework is intact, most of the evils of their mistakes will be confined to the interior of their developments. That's almost a verbatim quote. One of the other things looking ahead was, you know, although you shouldn't have buildings and housing fronting on a parkway, the parkway could have additional land for future institutions, schools, libraries, fire stations, police stations, any kind of civic facility, and to give them what he called liberal settings. So again, they're looking ahead. The city's going to grow. It's going to need these kind of facilities. They shouldn't just be jammed into some square block on a grid and be isolated or, in some cases, ugly. Sherry Olson, by the way, there are very few books on Baltimore. <laughs> that really go through its history. Sherry Olson's still one of the best ones because she's a geographer by training from Hopkins, but she also had a great sense of social history. So this is not a, you know, a nostalgic, the Baltimore we should have had, or you know, your grandfather experience. This is a very good book, and if you can get a hold of it, it's well worth reading. And she, she was very much one of the first people to appreciate the Olmsted contributions to 20th century Baltimore. This plan had a very strong stream valley focus. Um, again, the upper Piedmont kind of areas of the city, the high rolling terrain, that's where the development should occur. And then there's all these intervening stream valleys. They felt the stream valleys should be protected in their own right. Uh, the lower reaches were often pretty bad, industrialized, polluted. But when you got beyond the existing city limits, vast stretches of these stream valleys were almost pristine. They might have had a mill or a couple factories or a road or a bridge. But parts of the scenery are, are, were really still pretty much pristine and natural. In fact, in Stony Run and Wyman Park, he termed it one of the nicest areas so near a city that he knew. Stream valleys also had a practical purpose. One, you would break up what otherwise had been very dense, relentless growth, because if you protected the stream valleys, then the growth, there'll be isolated areas that won't get overrun. And so you have this contact with nature right in the midst of your city. Uh, implementation of flood control, which is a very serious problem in downtown Baltimore and on Jones Falls and so forth. It would reduce housing congestion because of breaking up the growth patterns. And it would also improve real estate values, which meant for the city it would improve property taxes. Streets, again, a big issue. So there's a whole section in here on streets and their proper role. And Olmsted actually rhetorically says, why am I talking about this? And then he goes on to explain why he's talking about this. One is the control of the street system was one of the few enforceable powers the city had to manage growth. In the late 19th century, they set up a topographical survey commission to deal with the annexation area. It was subsequently given powers in about, I think it was 1902, where anybody subdividing had to submit their street plat plan to the topographic survey committee, which would review it for grades and alignment. And if the committee could recommend to the county, the city council, not to accept the streets as public streets. 
it's one of the few weapons the city had, and they tried to make the most use of it. In fact, for a time, they overexceeded their powers by assuming the role of the council, just saying you can't do it. And then the city solicitor had to say, well. <laughs> um, part of it was like you locate parks, park facilities, and the like, where they will not block the most economical and efficient extensions of the street system or cut through the parks eventually. Um, also, there's a little section of principles of subdivision, which mainly applies to making sure these rights of way are protected. There was a lot of encroachment into what was being platted as future streets. You could do nothing about it if the landowner put a building there, and it created some really serious problems for doing a rational expansion of the street system. They're saying consciously use these and uh, protect these areas for the future if you're not going to basically accept the streets or develop them now. This is from the 1926 report. It's not a very good thing, but it's what they're talking about. You have a normal kind of commercial street for commercial traffic, a boulevard, which is a kind of high-class street that has some green amenity and maybe is uh, a backdrop for doing residential development and so forth, and then a true parkway, which is really, as you can see, I think this is Hilton Parkway, maybe, which is one of the few true parkways that actually comes out of this, as we'll see. Okay, a plan without a means to get it done is a wish list. So what happens when you submit this plan and it's adopted? Well, they did fall into this tide of civic improvement. And what happens is Baltimore City, which didn't have things like a public sewer system until 1911, uh, is doing all kinds of civic improvement. Basically, the people that run the city are fed up. Nothing from the Civil War till about the 1890s was done about anything. They're finding like the streets are crowded, they're inefficient, steep grades, you can barely get up the hills from downtown, uh, wires everywhere, you've got telegraph, telephone, electricity, it's cluttering, it's a fire hazard, people can't get the ladders up to buildings without killing themselves. There's no sewage system, it stinks, it's dangerous, typhoid, all this kind of stuff. So they, a new generation of civic leaders comes to the fore and say, we've got to change all this. One of the beneficiaries, to some degree, is the parks. So in 1905, there's a whole series of bond issues that get passed in the state uh, legislature and are put to the voters. The voters improve, approve $1 million in bond issues solely for parks. The problem was, politically, the council says, okay, you've got to spend 250 of that here, 250 of that here, 250 here, 250 here. What happens is, in the largely undeveloped north and northwest, they run out of money within a few years. In fact, they have so many opportunities, they can't fulfill them all. On the south and east side, where it's denser, land prices are higher, they run into trouble. And Eventually, what happens, you see most of those major acquisitions, they're all in the north or northwest. The slow pace and the limited success becomes a real political issue for years, and not just in the immediate years after the plan, but subsequently. Okay, nothing goes well entirely, and this is true in Baltimore. There are many initial setbacks that impede the progress of carrying the plan out, even though there was a lot of enthusiasm for it. One is a lot of these parkway li links get totally preempted within a year or two. I mean, there's a whole series of letters in early 1906 where Olmsted's saying, you can't get from Clifton Park to Patterson Park anymore, forget it. You can't get here anymore. The, the link from Druid Hill and Wyman Park on the west to the Lake Montebello Clifton Park area was supposed to be a 200 foot, a parkway following a stream bed and all this. Uh, they, as soon as they extend St. Paul Street, he says, forget it, it's all over. Uh, go ahead and make it a straight boulevard all along 33rd Street. Um, land price demands in the east especially were crippling. Druid Hill Park in the northwest part of the city was a very typical example of 19th century country park. It's 550 acres, was designed as a country park. Patterson Park was a kind of an ad hoc inheritance. Olmsted realized it was going to be very difficult to create a country park in the east side of Baltimore where the working class industrial population could get to. It's very hard for them to get to Druid Hill. You can't 
create that thing again in this section, but what you could do was expand Patterson Park, 127 acres, and get some of the features of a natural park into, into that environment. Unfortunately, the Canton Corporation, big industrial corporation, which developed the area called Canton, it's one of the first planned industrial centers in the United States, owns most of the land. They don't want to sell it. So for years goes on, Park Board offers, say, I don't know what the figures are exactly, $120 an acre. Canton Corporation says, no, $240. Park Board comes back later, $140 an acre. Canton says, $239. <laughs> and this goes on for years. So finally, what happens is they end up with only this small addition on the eastern part of the park. The parkway connections are gone. And this was typical of a, a, a number of other situations. The most important outcome of all this, though, was because of the reaction on the south and east side of the city when they tried to do another bond issue, it is crushed by the opposition. Only the northwest and northern parts of the wards voted for it. Everyone else votes against it because they feel they are getting left out. OK, there, the framework is created. And we can't get into a lot of detail, but the most, probably the most well-known are the residential neighborhoods in North Baltimore. Guilford, the second sections of Rowland Park, Homeland, and then a, a smaller uh, thing called Original Northwood. These are substantial areas. This, this area, Guilford, is about a mile by a half mile. So it is a big chunk of land. It's the old Abel estate that people that own the Sun paper. Um, homeland is similar. So they are filling in large parts of this framework they created. Also, along places, the Johns Hopkins campus, uh, eventually later the Baltimore Museum of Art, uh, the Episcopal Cathedral, all along these areas, Olmsteads are doing site playing, uh, major high schools, the boulevards, the parks are attracting these kind of institutional uh, sightings, and the Olmstead firm is often the people doing it. The landscape architect, I use that title because they had such a monopoly on work for about a decade and a half that often in the park board minutes, all it says, the landscape architect was in attendance and reported on the following. I don't even, they don't, everybody knows who it is. Um, so in addition to doing this general plan framework in that, they're doing a lot of very specific work. They designed Wyman Park, which is adjacent to the Hopkins campus. It's probably the first totally Olmsted designed park in the city. I mean, many of the parks that they worked on were not their original design. Even Mount Vernon, Olmsted Senior comes in and makes improvements to it. But again, this was, you know, he's following up on someone else's mistakes, generally. Um, they did several of the boulevards. They did this, the, the, the development plans. Uh, a number of very specific improvements for the four original parks that we saw in 1900. A gateway to Druid Hill, playground, play fields in Carroll Park, et cetera, and Clifton Park and that. What they never got the opportunity to do was actually do a comprehensive plan for each of these major parks. So we get a lot of ad hoc piecemeal kind of reform or changes, sometimes extruding intrusions from the park to another site. Um, actually, one of Olmsted's most valuable things no one knows about too much. He secretly fought putting the Mu Baltimore Museum of Art in Druid Hill, which was recommended by a New York architect who had the example of the Metropolitan Museum in Central Park. Oh, what a wonderful place to put it. He's writing letters, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. And finally, Hopkins bailed out everybody by giving a part of their campus to the present site. So he's involved in all kinds of, I mean, this is trench warfare in some ways. I mean, he's involved in a lot of these details. So. He's not only done this, it's the same in Washington, he's not only done this interesting plan, he's getting the opportunity to carry it out or modify it as circumstances dictate. And this really goes on for two decades, plus, for the firm. Okay, World War II, they, they're out of money. World War II is very disruptive, and so it's time to assess where we are. And so they're... As you can see, there, there's some major victories, and there's some major issues still outstanding. What happens? 
There's another annexation in 1918. Again, it revives interest in you know, growth management, street extensions, park development. The key thing now is the impetus from it is coming from a different group of people. It's not the park board anymore. It's uh, what they call the Commission on City Plan, which had absorbed the topographic survey. Joseph Shirley was the chief engineer for 30 years, and he had a lot of interest in city planning. He was a very strong ally of the Olmsteads. And in 1919, where they have to develop a street plan for the annex, he ties into park improvements based on a 194 plan. It goes nowhere. People are getting more and more antsy, including the editors of the Baltimore Sun. 1923, they invite Olmsted to kind of do a kind of 20-year retrospective. It's under the guise of reviewing the commission plan, but it's also an opportunity for him to assess what had happened over the last two decades. In general, he likes the recommendations of the commission because it's kind of in accord with his plan or mating, uh, making sensible adjustments because of changed circumstances. He does go back and talk about some of the major disappointments, uh, the failure to secure the parkways, which by now, I mean, the original concept is pretty much defunct. Also, very little success in putting playgrounds where the people are, what he called simple homely recreation. That still was a major pressing priority of the 1904 plan. It does not get done. He also declared the time is approaching for dealing with the outlying metropolitan areas and he actually wrote a very important paper called The Role of Metropolitan Parks or something, something like that, which I think originally was done in California and he adapted for Baltimore. The essay, also the, the fact that in a city with extensive shorelines, there's no, there's no major waterfront park is a, is a real affront to him. And he's basically saying this is a failure of city planning. Okay, another opportunity comes when there's another park board overhaul and William Norris, former head of the state senate from East Baltimore, becomes park chairman. He's committed to playgrounds, park extension. When he takes over, they adopt uh, a motion to hire the Olmsteads and to do another study. This becomes the 1926 plan. Um, as you can see, it's time. Even in 1926, much of the city's undeveloped, so there's still plenty of opportunity. At the time, Henry Hubbard of the Olmsted firm is now pretty much firmly in charge of this. Olmsted's in California most of the time. He's checking in now and then, but this is really a Henry Hubbard plan. And you can tell Henry Hubbard was one of the really pushers of city planning. And this plan, unlike the 1904 plan, adopts things like population projections, standards. For example, every school should have an extra 100 square feet for every child so they can play there after school. Um, so it's trying to use projections to estimate demand, also has a target date, 1950, which in 1904 plan, there was no target. Was like, we should get this done by this time. So they adopted 19... This is very much what you would see today. They also make an assumption. We don't need to make the argument for parks. We trust everybody understands this. It jumps right into it. Here's what you got to do here, here, and here. Uh, this is the, the overall map for the 1950 system. As you can see, it's closely tied to street improvements. In fact, now the park plan is embedded in a bigger concept, which includes streets and some other developments. Um, just to compare, that's the 1904 plan and that's the 1926 plan. So this is getting, one, be institutionalized as a part of city governance, and also there's a realization you've got to coordinate all this stuff, and that's what's being pushed. And to do that, there was like both general outlines of big areas and very a whole bunch of these in the plan, very specific property-based. I mean, Henry Hubbard was down there nine times in, in the year, and they're going out and saying, okay, we could draw the line here, we can draw the line there. So this is a, a really, this is an action agenda, more than a philosophical statement as 1904 was. All right, what happens? Well, of course, things go bad. They lose a bond issue in 29, uh, political rivalry within the city, of the opponent of the former chairman of the board, now back in the Senate, squelches it, and the Depression hits, so forth and so on. Okay, so everywhere else, World War II comes. After World War II, the impetus, the desire, and the understanding of parks is diminished. By the 1970s, the parks are often in bad shape, blah, blah, blah. In the 1980s, there's a revival in interest in the parks. They're actually being defended from being 
uh, sloughed off by the city. They wanted to give away this park, that kind of thing. So that was the battle of the 80s with just keeping the system intact. The Olmstead legacy becomes discovered by people in these groups. It becomes starting to be publicized. So often it is, is the basis for doing specific plans. This is Wyman Park Dell, part of that Olmstead design park. 2005, the Olmstead Friends of Wyman Park Dell group got money, raised money, to hire a consultant, did a master plan, and got the city to adopt it officially. This may be the model for other places. It is certainly the model for places in Baltimore. So what's happening is currently the Olmstead legacy, one, it gives you a pedigree to argue you can't mess this place up. And two, it also it gives you a footing. You go back and look at the original plans and figure out why they did it, and then you, can, you have a real solid plan to work on. So that is it, and I thank you. You can unbuckle your seatbelt. Thanks very much, David. Just I think what's very important, talking about Tom's bridge, I think that Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. certainly shows uh, how the period really is very important here, this idea of the turn of the century. If you didn't get your project implemented during the City Beautiful era, it probably wasn't going to happen. Uh, but also, I think in terms of parkway design, that, that bridge, again, that we saw between the sort of more intimate parkway design and the roadways, and I think of Rock Creek Park in particular and how beautiful and experiential, experientially sort of um, touching that is, uh, as opposed to the new motor era when we started to see cars moving faster, cars being more uh, readily reproduced, thanks to Ford. Uh, and then that change in that character, the speed and the width of the highways and the character of the highways. So this bridging that's beginning to happen, I think, is really critical here and how we start to see how Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. becomes that link uh, and perhaps doesn't quite keep up in some ways with some of those changes, which I think is also very interesting. We don't have a lot of time, I'm sorry, uh, for a lot of questions, but I think if, uh, I would like to uh, entertain um, maybe two or three questions uh, over the next two, uh, five minutes or so, if anybody has any. Nothing pressing? If I could just ask, yes, we do have a question. Um, hold on, we have the microphone here. So I'm surprised by the notion of a 200 foot wide parkway. Was that to include multiple uses? So a pedestrian path, bike path, motorway path? Like, I'm just curious, or trees? What? It's on. If you didn't hear that question was uh, questioning why the 200 foot right of way for a parkway, what other uses might have been intended for that? Yeah, um, the 200 foot width was to guarantee there was sufficient space to emulate a true park experience. Now there could be uh, additional carriage roads on either side. There could be some forms of light recreation. In fact, in some neighborhoods, it was probably it was figured that you know, casual recreation, walking, sitting, maybe throwing a ball around, was probably good, would be a good function of these parkways. But it was not intended to be a main line of communication for everyday traffic. And as we all know, in many cities, once traffic engineers get a hold of these spaces, they become raceways. Um, and Olmsted recognized this when, in fact, when he was doing the 23 essay, he basically says, I realize this concept is largely out of date. Motorists don't want to take long, languorous, curvy, they want to get from A to B. And that having a straight road that will accommodate lots of, more and more cars is, is we, we need to live with that. And that's why a lot of these things, they end up designing these kind of boulevards, not without, you know, probably regret, but without objection. In fact, one of the things I hope 
comes up later, is Olmsted is very astute about what's happening with the proliferation of automobiles. And it affects a lot of things they end up doing. In the 20s, he's writing all kinds of articles about metropolitan parks, people have access. We don't need to try to build big parks and cities. Let's get them out into the countryside for a weekend or a summer where they can camp, bring their car, bring their family. And it's like, OK, we've got a different world here. Let's deal with it. And I might just add that 200 feet is not that big uh, when you think of a, a long linear drive. Uh, does anybody know the exact width of Commonwealth Avenue? It's probably pretty close to about 200 feet. What is it? So 33rd Street is 120 feet. Right. The, the Intended, oh, it was intended that you had um, multiple lanes of parkway. So, Julie, it's like the Arbor Way in Boston. That was a 200-foot parkway. Um, so you have uh, central lanes where you'd have your, strip, your direct right. traffic, and then you'd have the side panels for residential and off-road, off and then you'd have a strip for equestrian, a strip for pedestrian. Ultimately, some of this gets transformed, so your center strip is where the trolley goes. Okay. I think we've Not only one of the problems was when they tried to cram that into 120 feet, Olmsted had real, real objections. That was what was happening. They were trying to cram those kind of multiple roadway, parkway kind of concepts into a, too small a, a right of way. And that created, like Charles Street, when they did it, which he did not do it. He, he hated what the outcome was. He's basically saying you can't compress these things and make them function well or look good. The Avenue Porsche, which is the model, is 480 feet across. It's much bigger. But if you go to Eastern Parkway, which Olmsted did, it's 180 feet. And so they knew very well all these dimensions and what they could and couldn't achieve. Yes, we have a question in the back. I understand in the early 1900s there was a great fire in the inner city of Baltimore. Did that create an opportunity for some urban parks? Judge Clark? <laughs> uh, Olmsted was actually hired by the commission that was set up after the fire to make recommendations. Um, there was some thought of taking the waterfront areas south of downtown and make it into some kind of promenade, whatever. And he recommended against it. He said, this is a working port. All you're going to do is you're going to, con you're going to confuse recreation and leisure with port traffic, I mean, railroad connections, unloading. He said, you've got to find other places to do that. Also, the burnt area was really the downtown, the commercial downtown. So the concern was to rebuild that. And other recommendations, like he wanted to widen some of the streets. One, it would be fire breaks, and two, it would be more efficient. And he tends to be overridden on all those because the property owners get split between those that are willing to donate the land and those that don't want to do it. So his, you know, like he's a consultant. His advice is sometimes taken and appreciated, and sometimes thank you, and uh, it was nice to work with you. It happened. So now 100 years later, that promenade is under uh, development. So we're going to take a little break. And we're going to take about 15 minutes. We'll call you back uh, in about 10 minutes from now.